We are here to discuss today the uh, project in the Nicobar Islands, uh, which has been uh, highly controversial, but the government seems determined to go ahead with it. Uh, we have with us today, uh, I would say, the leading expert on this uh, subject, Dr. Pankaj Sheikh Sariya, uh, who has been writing for a long time on the islands and particularly on this and other uh, so-called developmental uh, projects in the islands, uh, and who has uh, just released a book uh, curated by him with articles by several other environmentalists, ecologists, and others, uh, documenting the uh, huge potential destruction and the existing status of the ecology on the islands uh, and how precious uh, they are and what their uh, destruction is likely to uh, imply. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me welcome uh, Dr. Sheikh Sariya. Uh, Pankaj, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, no, welcome. Uh, Dr. Pankaj Sheikh Sariya is currently with uh, IIT Mumbai uh, with uh, C. Tara uh, and uh, other uh, departments of uh, the IIT. So, Pankaj, uh, let me begin by uh, asking you briefly for the benefit of our viewers uh, what this project is and what uh, you think are the major ecological uh, disasters uh, likely from this project. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Raghu. So uh, just to give a very quick snapshot of what this project is, uh, this is a really massive project of, uh, estimated to be at a budget of about 72 to 75,000 crores. That is nearly $10 billion. In just one single island in the Andaman and Nicobar group, uh, known as Great Nicobar Island, uh, which is the southernmost in the Andaman and Nicobar group, it sits right on top of the Malacca Straits and is very close to Indonesia. So it's really far away uh, from where we are sitting, both in Bombay and in Delhi. Uh, this project was proposed about three years ago. Uh, kind of catalyzed and pivoted by the Niti Aayog. And like I said, 72,000 crores. It's a, it's what they are, they are calling a holistic development proposal for that island, which is primarily composed of four different components embedded into one project. There is a massive uh, transshipment port in a place called Galatia Bay uh, in the southern part of the island, which is estimated to cost about 40 to 42,000 crores. So that is the major investment expected in this uh, in this entire project there is a power plant uh, which is also a substantial investment which of course will be required to run uh, all the infrastructure that will be created uh, there is an airport that is proposed and then there is a huge uh, more than 100 square kilometers of largely tropical pristine tropical forest that is uh, slated to be developed as a new township and a, and a tourism hub and things like that so uh, you mentioned galatia bay uh, so let us begin there. Uh, this is the famous uh, nesting site uh, uh, for the uh, uh, turtles, uh, which are by themselves a rare uh, species uh, in the Indian Ocean. And this is one of their few uh, uh, large nesting sites. Uh, and the proposed port is resting right at the mouth of the uh, river, which is the nesting site. Uh, of the great pack turtles. So tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. So this is uh, this is a bay known as Galatia Bay where a river of the same name enters uh, the ocean. And by mainland standard, it's not a very big river, but by island standard, it's a it's a reasonably large river. At the bay of the at the bay uh, where the river enters the sea uh, is a very beautiful and large strip of a bee, uh, uh, almost two kilometers and perhaps longer of soft white sand and considerable width, uh, which is one of the most, uh, like you yourself just mentioned, a very prominent and a very important nesting site of a turtle known as a giant leatherback turtle, uh, which is one of seven species of sea turtles on planet Earth and the largest of uh, those seven species. Now, uh, the giant leatherback is found all over the globe, 
uh, but in the northern indian ocean in this part of the world the nicobar islands the andaman and nicobar islands uh, nicobar islands in particular and this particular island of great nicobar is considered to be the most important nesting site of this particular turtle and galathia bay uh, where like you mentioned uh, the port is going to come up even among the nicobar even among great nicobar island beaches it is one of the most uh, important uh, from whatever limited documentation we've had over the last many years by actually by the forest department of the andaman and nicobar administration and other researchers it shows very large number of female turtles come to this beach uh, to nest and this will this beach and this bay will completely be destroyed uh, because this 40000 crore investment of a port is supposed to come here uh, and among other things uh, as you will imagine to construct a port uh, to ensure that uh, the waters are still and calm for shipping to take place there's a proposal to build a, a, a breakwater uh, which will restrict the opening to the bay which is today about three kilometers wide to just 10 percent of that original opening so you can imagine a sea turtle accessing her nesting ground her nesting beach through a door uh, that's about three kilometers wide and if the port is to come up and if it gets its permissions and if it is constructed this huge opening will be restricted to just 10 percent so the opening that will be left uh, for the turtle like it would be for the ships would be 300 meters yeah. and it's extremely unlikely uh, or it's very likely that this is going to cause huge damage because not only is the opening re restricted but you can imagine the kind of activity that's going to start exactly. in the port ships coming in and out light sound pollution the occasional space exactly so it's it's actually an invitation for disaster yeah that's and right yeah, I mean, it, will, it will virtually wipe out those nesting grounds it will wipe out the nesting ground and yeah. also just mention that uh, about a couple of years ago, the government of India, through its Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change, had released a National Marine Turtle Action Plan in which Galatia Bay is listed as one of the most important marine turtle nesting sites in this country. Yeah. So there is all around acceptance of the importance of this particular place. Yeah. So uh, this is as far as the turtles uh, are concerned. Uh, the the area where the port is going to come up uh, is also home to two major and uh, ancient tribes uh, of the subcontinent and particularly of the Andaman and Nicobar uh, chain uh, of islands, that's the Sentinelese and the Nicobarese uh, population. It's not, the, it's not the Sentinelese, the Champagne. Uh, the, sorry, yeah, the Champagne. Uh, and the uh, uh, Nicobar uh, tribes and the Champagne are very small in number uh, as it is dwindling and a threatened uh, population. And if uh, the kind of huge construction which is uh, being envisaged uh, for the port, which is also even directly eating into the uh, areas where uh, the Champagne reside, uh, who are proposed to be shifted out uh, tribes which have, who have been staying there for millennia, uh, undisturbed by uh, other activity, are essentially going to be again uprooted uh, from there. Absolutely. So uh, if you might look at these two communities uh, differently, the Champagne is also what is known as a PVTG, which is a particularly vulnerable tribal group. Like you rightly said, the numbers are very small. And as a matter of fact, we know rather little about this community because uh, they remain quite remote in the forest. They are a hunting, gathering, nomadic community uh, of which not much has been studied or understood. There are various bands and I know even little. Actually, in the book that you mentioned, The Great Nicobar Betrayal, we have two very uh, beautifully and powerfully written pieces yes. uh, by uh, two very accomplished writers, Ajay Saini and Manish Chandi, who write about the tribal condition and the issues over there. And even if you see what they have to say, we it, we do realize that we know little about the Champagne, except for the fact that they have been there for a very, very long time. They uh, forage and hunt and roam around the forest in different bands, gathering resources, living a life that they have been living in their own way for a very long time. Right. They're very small numbers. They are a vulnerable community. And uh, there is going to be both a direct and an indirect impact of this whole project and not just the port. The port of course will have its impact yeah. but imagine uh, 100 square kilometers of that forest being taken over for a new township and a tourism project. 
a power plant coming in and uh, so there's going to be that physical taking taking away of the land and the resources uh, at least some of which this uh, some of this land we know that they actually directly use traditionally yes. have been yeah other related you know important dimension to this is that as part of the proposal itself and in a modified form the project proponents have said that the population of this island will increase from 8000 people today today the population of this particular island is only 8000 yeah. to 300000 people by the time this project is executed which is in 25 years now uh, just imagine a situation where you have a, a shampin community of maybe 250 or 300 individuals and look at the ratio that will change in terms of one shampin to one outsider yeah now they will be swamped and not only will the land be taken over uh, there is no way to control the activities of so many people on that okay. island you go further into the forest forests will be cut water resources cultural impact so it's a it's writing the death knell for that community that's it's right already vulnerable so that yeah. is one aspect to yeah. what the champena yeah, that's just have, the initial part quite right and we have already seen the impact that even the uh, uh, main settlements around port blair uh, have done to the jarwas uh, community there uh, and the virtual sort of uh, invasion of their land and their culture that's taken place and this is an uh, in a sense hitherto untouched uh, tribe uh, more or less who have been living on their own and this is going to be a massive invasion of the island and as you said quite apart from the fort and the township there's going to be huge amount of disturbance all around like we have seen elsewhere in the andaman islands when this scale of uh, settlement of outsiders uh, take place now all this is also going to mean now, if I might just add, if yes. I might just add here, you know, you mentioned scale, which is why I just like to, the scale of this project is nothing, I mean, nothing of this kind has been seen in the islands quite ever. Right. Quite right. And just to give context, the total population of all the Andaman and Nicobar islands, uh, you know, we are talking of 600 islands right. in the Andaman and Nicobar group, many of which are not inhabitable, but the those islands which are people living on, in a total group of 600 islands, the total population in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands today is about is about 500,000 people. Yeah. That's 5 lakh people. And you are going to bring in 300,000 people into just this one island. Okay. So, like you said, the impact that we've seen on the ecology and the tribal communities with 5 lakh people across 600 islands, yeah. that has been quite disastrous. Yes. Imagine uh, one small community having to face up to 300,000 people Quite. in one you know, restricted landscape. It's a it's a complete recipe for disaster. Now, the port itself, as well as the planned uh, township, uh, is envisaged to come up by uh, clearing a very large area of forests uh, on the islands, uh, and which is itself not just directly clearing of the forest. It's going to also involve then road building, airport construction, uh, etc. So again, there's going to be large scale destruction of forests, which are among the most pristine uh, forests in the uh, in the Indian subcontinent across the Andaman uh, islands. And that itself is another uh, story which you've documented extensively uh, elsewhere, as well as in the uh, book. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the kind of forest this is and what the implications would be if uh, this vast area of forest land is cleared. I think one thing, fair, one fair thing to say is that this is a forest that still has not been documented fully. Yeah, uh, it is. It is tremendously rich in terms of the biodiversity, uh, the avifauna, herpetofauna, uh, butterflies, insects uh, that 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 exist over here. Uh, it is uh, it is very beautiful to say the least. It is a very rich forest, and uh, like you mentioned, by official figures, a statement in statement in Parliament about a year ago, a year and a half ago, the government itself has said that about a million trees are going to be cut in this particular uh, project. Now, in a moment of climate change, in a moment where the entire world is worried about the rising global temperatures and the impact. 
what sense does it make to go ahead and create a project that will then cut down another million trees? Right. So the, the impact of it can only be imagined and one can only right. imagine the because there will be an impact locally in the sense that we are going to lose the forest, we are going to lose uh, all kinds of species of biodiversity, many of which perhaps have not been documented. Yeah. Uh, rare endangered birds and animals that we know about and we do know that already from the little research done that that part of the island where the project is coming up is the stronghold of some of these species. Those species are going to be affected. Quite right. It's not just the land-based uh, creatures that are going to be affected. This will have an impact on the coastal and the marine systems as well. Sure. So sure. the turtles, of course, will be affected like we just discussed. But yeah. what will happen to the coastline? You know, when you cut down 100 square kilometers, 130 square kilometers of forest, there will be erosion uh, because this is an area of high rainfall, uh, yeah. high... Uh, high radiance, uh, the, the soil will dry up, it will get yeah. washed away in the rains. Yeah. This will have an impact on the coastline. Sure. So the implications are going to be manifold and we actually don't even know what the implications Quite are. Right. Quite right. Uh, because of the uh, cascading effect. Yes. One of the big tragedies of this uh, project uh, has been that if any kind, uh, this scale of project is taken up anywhere on the mainland or in the islands, it would require and call for very extensive environmental impact assessment uh, to study what the environmental impact of such a project would be. Uh, but in this case, there has been what I can only term uh, regulatory capture. Uh, all the necessary processes that should have gone into it have been uh, either bypassed or deliberately uh, shall we say, overstepped, stepped over uh, in granting permissions. Uh, perhaps we may uh, require even a separate interview to discuss all the various uh, violations of environmental impact uh, assessments that have been done. But if you could sum up for us in a few minutes, uh, what have been the major uh, uh, travesties uh, in terms of how this was granted uh, permission uh, to go ahead, including uh, a stamp of approval by the National Green Tribunal, which is otherwise supposed to be a custodian of the uh, environment. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right in terms of, we can have another interview or another discussion entirely on the various things that have gone wrong. What is very striking, I, and I've been saying this in the presentations and discussions on the book, is how well planned and how efficiently this whole process has been carried out. So uh, on the one hand, we might say that there is, uh, in, and there still is, but all the boxes that need to be ticked or checked from a legal or a policy perspective have actually been ticked. So it looks like it's all been done, but there are so many, many, many problems. Let me give you a couple of, or maybe two or three examples of this since you asked. Galatia Bay, where the port is going to come up, uh, and like we said, the turtles come to nest, was in the 90s declared, or there was an, what's known as intention to declare a wildlife sanctuary over there. And it's very clearly there in the notification that this is a very important turtle nesting site. And, and just to add that it is not just the giant leatherback that nests here, there are three other species of turtles that also come to the beaches of the Galatia Bay to, to nest. So in 1991, this was proposed to be declared a wildlife sanctuary. And for some reason, it never got finally notified, like is the case with many protected areas around the country. Uh, but that does not deny the reality that the turtles nest there and that this is an ecologically very valid space and a very important space. Now, when the process for this project started, and I mentioned to you that uh, in uh, the National Marine Turtle Action Plan, Galatia Bay is listed as a very important turtle nesting site. Now, if you look at the chain of events, the National Marine Turtle Action Plan was released something around the middle of January 2021, in which Galatia Bay is mentioned as the most important nesting turtle uh, uh, nesting site. And that would presumably mean that it is sacrosanct and nothing to happen. But just 15 days earlier, in that same month of January 2021, under the watch of the same environment minister, the National Board for Wildlife, has explicitly allowed for the denotification of this sanctuary with the explicit argument that this bay is required for the construction of a port. So in the first week of January, they have denotified right. the sanctuary 
and 15 days later the same government releases a you know a national action plan which says the nesting site is important so you might say that they have followed due process uh, but actually have they followed due process in that sense yeah in and fact many of the many of the case instances you document in your book uh, refer to um, uh, a pre day uh, uh, permissions being granted prior to uh, the actual application moved or the uh, mm -hmm. assessment being done or the approvals being given but action on that has already been uh, initiated earlier for Absolutely. instance one of the very striking uh, things is because so much large forest land is being cleared there is a proposal to compensate for that loss of uh, forests but the proposed uh, compensatory afforestation is not taking place on any tropical uh, area or island but is taking place in the state of haryana in a arid or semi arid uh, zone uh, in the foothills of the aravallis where you cannot possibly replicate the kind of forest that is uh, being cut down and apparently the um, the government in haryana knew about this plan and had given its approval before the actual proposal was mooted absolutely and i wouldn't even say apparently i am convinced that was the case because we document the evidence in the book where the chief minister of haryana actually uh, said that we will use money for a safari park and this is money that we are getting because of the compensatory thing right. happening in the jubar and this is even before the ministry the central ministry which is the mandated agency to announce this has made it public so right. the government of haryana already knew that they are getting this before the clearance was actually granted okay. so i totally right and related to this uh, ragu the other interesting thing is and we documented it and it's there in the book is uh, the the stage 1 forest clearance so there is a forest advisory committee in the ministry that is supposed to look at all projects for uh, forest diversion and uh, in october 2020 when the first application was made for the diversion of this forest in nicobar for this project and october 2022 when the first stage 1 clearance was granted the forest advisory committee had 22 or 26 meetings uh, in this period of 2 years and there is not any evidence either in the agenda notes of the forest advisory committee meetings or in the minutes of the meetings that were held that this project was ever listed leave alone discussed for clearance and then suddenly one day in october 2022 they say that we grant its forest one uh, stage one forest clearance so the implication is that this has actually never been discussed by that regulatory platform that should have discussed this in the first place but they have gone ahead and given clearance so it happens again and again and again and like i also mentioned in uh, I, and i've been mentioning uh, there is when the project was proposed the andaman and nicobar uh, tribal welfare department which is the primary agency mandated with the welfare of the tribal communities in this case like we discussed a pvtg a, a particularly vulnerable tribal group explicitly makes a statement to the project proponent that Uh, we will help you in any way required to get land uh, in the interest of the project and which actually means that they will allow for land reserved in the name of the tribal communities for this project so yeah. that agents which which should actually be fighting for the rights and protecting the rights of this community is yeah. going all out of its way to say we will actually allow this land to uh, you know be alienated and be given up for the project okay. so we see this across the board we see this across the board like point pankaj uh, i'd like to now come to two aspects which we haven't discussed and uh, which have been covered in other writings of yours uh, but not in this book uh, in particular uh, and we need to discuss those because the reason the government advances for the absolute essential nature or character of this uh, transshipment port is that the uh, great nicobar islands and where the port is to be located is uh, situated just next to the malacca straits to the entry which is an important shipping lane it has national security uh, considerations which would be reinforced 
by building this uh, port and having a township uh, there, etc. And in fact, the NGT has cited this as the major uh, uh, reason why uh, any considerations of ecology can be put to one side because national security is uh, involved. So uh, talk to us a little bit about why this particular site uh, was chosen for it. And in particular, something which has not been discussed elsewhere, is that not a possibility of locating this transshipment port somewhere else, even in the Andaman and Nicobar chain? So I, I would like to just start off by responding to the NGT question. And again, in the book, we have, have this excellent article by Norma Alvarez, a very yes. well-known and reputed lawyer. And she shows us in multiple ways how the NGT approach, the what the NGT has relied on, including the point that you make. It is not the job of the NGT to look at other matters. It has to right. adjudicate on matters, environment and ecological. And they have clearly not done the job that they're supposed to do. Yes. Uh, there's enough evidence uh, presented in the affidavits and the NGT itself acknowledges that there are gaps. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's actually very strange. That's what Norma says, that they should uh, rely upon some newspaper reports and say something about the project and then say it's okay and 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 exactly like you said oh in the defense interest so where the defense thing is concerned uh, Raghu, i think uh, one does require a lot more engagement and i think there are people better equipped to answer that but i would like to actually put across three or four questions one i would ask from a researcher's perspective is what is the evidence that we have that all the people, including journalists, including politicians, policymakers, saying that this is important. Hmm. Beyond making that statement, what is the evidence that is offered to us in that sense? That's an important question to ask. Maybe there yeah. is, I'm not saying it is, but yeah. where is that evidence? What is it going to show? Just because we are sitting on top of an important shipping lane, uh, what value would it really add to have an establishment of this exactly. kind of and how so viable is, how viable is a transshipment port uh, there? I come to that. That that's the that's that that will be the last point I want to make. But I'm just on the defense angle yet. Now I also want to say one other thing is that if you so there, there is very little discussion on this in the general public and in the media. There was a very interesting article by Admiral Prakash, former chief of naval staff, about a month ago in the Indian Express, make, making it very explicit that we have to separate the question of the transshipment port from defense. Yes. So I, I do want to point out that there is a lot of discussion informally and some formally in social media among defense personnel, among ex-defense personnel, saying that even if this project is of strategic importance, uh, to ask whether this is the way to go about and doing exactly. it. Exactly. So, yeah. so that's one question to be asked. Yeah. Now the third very crucial point that we are missing is that in the entire framing and the proposal of this 72,000 crore project, there is no defense element. Yeah. This is an out and out commercial project. Yes. This is a 42,000 crore transshipment port that is meant for commercial traffic. Absolutely. So people who have shown interest in investing in this, in the expression of interest, include foreign investing companies and foreign construction companies. Uh, 130 square kilometers of land is thought uh, to be used for a tourism project and for a township. Uh, so the question is, is it really a yeah. defense and a strategic project? Quite. And the last very important point, which we have not discussed at all, and maybe we will, uh, is that this project and this island sits on one of the most tectonically active faults right. on this planet. The Nicobar Islands experiences one earthquake a week on an average. Uh, the site of this port and this project is only 100 nautical miles from the epicenter of the earthquake of December 2004 that caused one of the biggest tsunamis and destruction that we have ever seen. Nicobar Island, Great Nicobar Island, where the project is coming up, saw a permanent subsidence of 15 feet the morning of that earthquake. So the lighthouse at Indira Point, which our defense minister and president also went to recently, can be seen standing surrounded by waters of the Andaman Sea. This is because before 2004, this a lighthouse stood above the high tide line. Quite. Today, it stands in water because the land subsided. Now it is in this landscape 
you want to invest 72,000 crores, imagine the liability you are creating. Yes. Another earthquake, another subsidence or uplift of two feet and your entire infrastructure, your entire investment is all gone. It's washed away in the blink of an eye. Right. So, so and imagine this being a defense project, a strategically important project. You're quite right. So, I think we have to deeply question this idea that this is a strategically important and a defense right. project. It seems to be a cover. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if it's a cover. Uh, all right. But it's a, it's a cover for a very high risk investment in a commercial project. Uh, which and, and if, one yeah. wonders. One, yeah. one wonders the logic and the wisdom. Where is the logic of it? Exactly. Exactly. And how, how viable is it to invest with such a high risk? Uh, project is uh, is a mystery. Okay, I'll come to the last uh, question. I know that this discussion has spanned, uh, has covered a lot of issues, uh, but it's in the nature of this project itself that all these issues are involved and highlights why this project is so important uh, for those who are proposing it, but in particular for those who are opposing it. Uh, who are highlighting all the different reasons why it should not come up. So let me take the last part. The Niti Ayo, when it proposed this project and others, has also proposed a whole set of so-called developmental projects across the Andaman uh, and Nicobar chain, as well as on the other side, on the Arabian Sea in Lakshadweep, all focusing on airports and tourism destinations, uh, and so on. So it's not just this island, but it's a whole host of other islands which are going to be uh, converted to tourism destinations with uh, hotels, resorts, airports, transport arrangements, uh, and so on, uh, which is going to then see, as much as this port uh, is going to see a wholesale uh, ravaging of the uh, e ecosystem across the Andaman and Nicobar chain. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, the Great Nicobar project, I mean, nothing surpasses uh, that in terms of scale and size. Sure. Uh, it really kind of is epitomizes the idea that uh, that is being proposed. And I think we have to, as a country, as, as a society, uh, really ask a question of what these development projects are all about. Exactly. And we are talking of uh, both in, in, in the case of Lakshadweep and in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, small island groups are extremely vulnerable in any case. And with the increasing evidence and the impact of climate change, we are going to spaces with, uh, with long histories, long cultural histories and ecological histories, very unique landscapes ecologically and culturally and from the social aspect. And this bulldozing, this kind of imposing this kind of investment, imposing this kind of development paradigm, which uh, is is only going to, I mean, saying that it's going to destroy is actually an understatement because yes. it, is, it is going to, in an obvious way, impact the forest, impact the coastline, impact the oceans because so many people going there, what will happen to basic things like water requirement, Correct. waste will be created, you know, sewage that will be there, solid waste, uh, the, the, the people over there, the, the biodiversity. So, what is this larger paradigm of development? What is this vision that we have for these islands? Are we not forgetting that these islands have identities and existence independent of the larger systems that they are part of? Yeah. They are part of the systems that we are part of, but they also have very unique identities. Island systems are uh, are very different from mainland systems. Uh, they, they, their context is very different. Their needs are very different. So unless we rethink and we seriously re-examine this, uh, this is in nothing but a recipe for disaster because these investments are not sustainable. They were not sustainable in any case. And with the conditions in which they are currently operating, with particularly right. with climate change, and right. we are actually seeing as of today, very recently, reports of mass bleaching of coral in the luxury. Yes. So, uh, what is this actually going to lead to besides a further degradation, a further right. impact on these systems, both culturally uh, socially Quite. and economically. Quite. And so, it's not going to benefit anybody, I think, even in the middle term, leave alone the long yeah, term. Yeah. term is certainly not going to benefit. Middle term Quite is not right. going to benefit. Quite right. Completely, okay. completely so, uh, so can we uh, wrap this discussion 
uh, now. What is the current status of this project? Where does it stand? Are there any, is there any scope left uh, for opposing the project? Uh, what can citizens groups and others do uh, to try and see if possible that this project does not take off? So where the status is concerned, Raghu, uh, I think the government is going ahead as, as if nothing has happened. Uh, so they are very keen on pushing the project. And as a matter of fact, today's Indian Express has a very interesting article in which suddenly a patch of land that was a CRZ1A where the port is supposed to come up and by law, nothing comes up in CRZ1A. Uh, there's been affidavit filed in the NGT matter saying uh, this is the National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management right. has now classified that area as CRZ1B. So and now a port can come up. So, uh, I mean, uh, we were just discussing as to Quite. what is the evidence that this body has to say this is not CRZ1A for it, it, including the NGT saying that this is CRZ1A and tell us how can you construct a port. Here. Yeah. So it seems that the government is keen on going ahead and they're doing the regular things in terms of this, this is a suddenly different category of land now. Right. So, uh, But also to say that what has happened where the project is concerned is all the permissions or most of the permissions have been granted. Very little, if any, work has started on the ground. So that is yeah. where the status is concerned. And we are in the monsoon, so it's also going to be difficult for anything to start off immediately right. because in the islands, we have a very strong monsoon. Yeah, impossible. So so is, is there, there any Yeah, is there the any potential? Question, yeah. Yeah, to, to larger question, you know, I feel there always is hope. And I think the very fact that we are having this conversation is that the word has gone around, uh, that people have seen, uh, that people are concerned. Uh, that people want to raise their concerns about it. And in the last three years, there has been a huge amount of interest in this project. The media, various aspects of the media, the mainstream media, online media, students, groups, activists have constantly raised questions about this. People have been asking questions in parliament. Uh, a number of RTIs have been filed. Uh, they are being denied under national security clauses. A uh, lot of information has been generated. And I think this is, to me, evidence of the fact that we are all concerned. Yeah. And the hope is that authorities will see the concern and they will recognize that this is not a place worth destroying, certainly not at the cost that you know, we will all have to pay. Where citizens are concerned, I think there's a lot that can be done. Uh, there is there's a requirement for all of us to write to our rulers and our government to say that we as citizens, as collectives, are very worried about this project. I think it makes an impact to the concerned authorities. There is a need for more research. There's a need for more understanding of what has gone on in this legal process. Uh, we've been discussing, for example, and what you mentioned in the beginning, the Environment Impact Assessment Report, which is a complete farce. Yes. But that needs to be studied further from a scientific perspective. Our scientific community has to stand up and say that this cannot be done in their name. Uh, I think there's potential for uh, more journalism, more journalistic work, more investigations to be done. So I think sure. there are opportunities across the board. There is a need for an economic assessment of the project. Sure. You know, my sense is that the numbers that have been provided, uh, you know, leave alone the cost of the environment and the loss of yeah. people, like whether economically in terms of the Quite transport right. and the traffic it will move, Quite whether right. that will really happen. Quite so I think, so you know, I think there are lots of avenues. Uh, to sure. keep engaging, to keep sure. raising our concern. And I am very hopeful, Raghu, because uh, I think uh, we will all realize and we do all realize that uh, uh, maybe a mistake was made when this was started off, but there's an opportunity to correct it. And right. I think that can easily be done. Uh, we've not started the project on the ground. So there's no reason why we don't have to hope and why we cannot believe that right. uh, uh, not go ahead. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Pankaj. I think on that optimistic note, uh, we can close this interview uh, for now, but the subject is not closed. And I'm pretty sure that we will be back uh, for another conversation on this in the not too distant uh, future as further developments unfold. Uh, once again, thank you to Pankaj uh, Sheikh Sariya for this uh, wide ranging, but unfortunately, unfortunately necessarily short uh, interview because of the vastness of the subjects uh, issued. This has been News Click. Thank you for being with us.